Hello, everybody. It is provident that this discussion takes place downtown with you in this place where much activism has been celebrated and fostered. In my 50 years here, I can't tell you the number of times I've been in this room commiserating, strategizing, learning things, including at times how odious I am. Much love, much contestation, much self-discovery. I will not speak over long about tonight's topic. Professor Wecker will do that magnificently. <clears throat> what I want to say is that she, like Audre Lorde, someone who is a prominent foremother in Professor Wecker's book, White Innocence, combines activism, ruthless clarity, and generosity. For to truly love human possibility is to be generous and also to be critical. All nations do horrible things to survive, and all nations must be held accountable for the suffering they cause. As Professor Recker writes, judging by curricula at various educational levels, from grade schools to university level, it is the best kept secret that the Netherlands has been a formidable imperial nation. Students in my classes are always surprised and appalled when they hear about the Dutch role in the slave trade and colonialism, often for the first time. Such historical evasion and erasure is not by accident. How post-racial are we, Trump-bluffing America? James Baldwin once wrote, one can lie about the body, but the body does not lie about itself. It does not lie about the forces that propel it. As Professor Wecker shows and brilliantly, this is true about societies also. A society often lies, but its ramifications are seen everywhere in its values and those it betrays. When I grew up in Harlem, I saw a society that undervalued everyone who lived with me. We had lives of enormous richness, industry, evangelizing inventiveness. I see many of the resultant progeny of that social disavowal now when I teach at local prisons. If we don't radically alter our sense of society and its need to champion all of us, our fear will grow, our children will sour, and the dispossessed will grow like kudzo reeds. Professor Wecker has taught at Oberlin, at Ultrick University, which is a chair of women's studies. She lectures far and wide, and also has held important positions in the Dutch government, in the Ministry of Wellbeing, Health, and Culture. By the way, this reminds me of Latin American scholars who actually do things in the world. Not like some of us. <laughs> With her trenchant book, White Innocence, she also published The Politics of Passion, Women's Sexual Culture, and the African Suriname Dias Diaspora. From the moment she received her doctorate, she began to demand that her society take itself seriously, that to do otherwise is to deform and pervert. For those of us of color, her interaction with a police officer in 2004 is painfully poignant. Professor Wecker was arrested because she is black and becomes argumentative. What's new? Things that should have been routine for any Dutch citizen, which of course she was, were not pro-offered her, to her. She even, after much antagonism, calls the police, quote, fascist. Because the white policemen see her as a person of color. In their mind, she is clearly poor, jobless, and in Wecker's terms, in need of disciplining. But her courage here, in the Dutch context, is even more complicated. Since, as she writes, in the Dutch situation, where there is virtually no oral transmission of knowledge about racism between or with in generations of black people, where more or less sophisticated discourses with regard to race and racism are severely lacking, 
a prominent reaction among blacks and whites alike is to deny the seriousness of the racist event, to belittle it, to hold it up to impossible definitional standards, to analyze it to pieces so that it evaporates into thin air. One of the tenets of MITWS is that personal history matters, that it informs all that one does, and that it can act as a door providing access to others, community, and the world. Or it can act like a wall and make one further self-involved, cut off, and contemptible. Make you into a Donald Trump, oafish, misogynistic racist. Professor Wecker, in her scholarship, activism, and unstinting belief that a just society demands vigilance, people willing to, to be brutally self-critical has provided us the cartography, the map outward, to a world in which each of us is valued. There is no evasion or dilly-dallying in her work. She will not let anything vanish into thin air. Everyone in this room works, has relationships, prizes their family, and hopefully others. Each of us is involved in society. If we are smart, as Professor Wecker shows, we will not easily submit to a country or an ideology that brutalizes people of color, workers, trans and gay people, the incarcerated, the poor, the young, the elderly, or threatens the planet with our unfettered selfishness. In one of the fine chapters in Professor Wecker's book, by the way, read this damn thing, you're diminished if you don't. The title says it all, the house that race built. Well, houses can be dismantled, they can be made better and healthier, tyrants can be disposed, and fools unmasked. Dare to struggle, dare to win. It is a great honor to present Professor Webb. Thank you so much, Ken, for your uh, generous introduction. Thank you, audience, for coming. And I want also to thank the organization for inviting me here. It uh, means a lot to me to be sharing my thoughts with you because I owe a lot to my US education. I would not have been able to write this book without um, doing my PhD in the United States. I came here in 1987 uh, to UCLA, and I left in 1992. And um, I came because I was at a loss um, how I would do my dissertation in the Netherlands. There was nobody specialized in um, race, Gender was still very much um, uh, a budding endeavor. Um, and I wanted to write about women's Surinamese working class um, sexuality, the, the constructions of sexuality that they made. And so because I couldn't find anybody uh, to do that with in the, United, in, in the Netherlands, I came to the United States. So, to me, it's very special to be standing here for you today. Um, I will um, start off with a quote by Toni Morrison that speaks forcefully to me, and that is as true for the United States as for the Netherlands and other places in Europe. Uh, this is a quote from her short article, Home in the House that Race Built, it goes like this, I have never lived, nor have any of us, in a world in which race did not matter. Such a world, free of racial hierarchy, is usually imagined or described as dreamscape, Edenesque, utopian, 
so remote are the possibilities of its achievement. This is important now, what she's going to say now. How to be both free and situated. How to convert a racist house into a race-specific yet non-racist home. How to enunciate race while depriving it of its lethal cling. So to me, this speaks so um, importantly to what the program is that we need to engage in. We do not want to be colorblind. We do not want to deny race. We want to convert a racist house into a race-specific yet non-racist home. Okay, so under these auspices, I will first begin to catch some beginnings and impulses I had to writing this book, which will also serve as a kind of self-positioning as to the positions that I write from. Secondly, I will talk about um, four important paradoxes in Dutch self-representation. My book is about the dominant way in which the Dutch like to tell a story to themselves about themselves, who we are, how we have come to be who we are. And I'm going to point to some important paradoxes in that dominant story. In the third part, I will talk about, so what does that dominant Dutch self-representation look like? What kind of package are we dealing with? Um, and you will see some things we have in common between the US and the Netherlands, but also some things are decidedly different because of our different histories. I think you have a different dominant narrative about yourself in which for a long time I think the story of the American dream figured very largely, but uh, I'll leave that um, until the, the question and answer period to delve deeper into. Um, the next um, uh, part of my lecture will be about what situation we find ourselves in now after Trump got elected. Um, we've had some foreshadowings of that situation in the Netherlands when in 2010 Geert Wilders, the leader of the Party for Freedom, um, supported the government that was then formed. We do not have a two-party system, we have a multi-party system, and all the time coalitions have to be formed to gain a majority in Parliament. And at that particular juncture, um, Geert Wilders was asked to support the government uh, that got to be formed, which was a coalition of uh, conservative Democrats, and Christian Democrats. And so I will talk a little bit about that, what we might be looking towards. So the first part is about the different beginnings and impulses to this book. Um, I returned to the Netherlands in 92. That was a big question after I finished my PhD. Uh, whether I was going to stay in the United States or go back to the Netherlands. I uh, taught for a while at Oberlin College, but I also felt very strongly that um, if I was needed anywhere, it would be uh, in the Netherlands. And so I uh, decided to go back uh, to the Netherlands. But you will notice, if you have any acquaintance with scholars of color from Europe, that a whole bunch of them uh, leave Europe to go teach in the United States, which uh, makes it very uh, difficult for those of us who remain um, to not be extremely lonely. Um, and I myself have found that I have really needed my friends in uh, the UK, but also in the United States to sustain the projects that I work on. So there is a, a network of 
uh, feminists of color that uh, uh, spans uh, a, a large part of the earth. In my case, also people in um, Suriname. Um, I also have people in, in uh, uh, different parts of Africa, but importantly, S South Africa. Uh, but most importantly to me, people, colleagues from the States and the UK have been important. When I returned in 1992 to the Netherlands, I was immediately struck by the lack of discourse about race. It was not a topic that people talked about. Um, the most racist remarks or events could pass without anybody saying anything about it. I came to see the Netherlands as the emperor with his, without his clothes on, as in his most detestable nakedness. Um, an important moment to me um, was when I had a sabbatical in 2000, which I spent at Columbia University uh, for six months, and I was staying with a friend who took me to the African burial ground in New York City, and to my great surprise, I saw um, all kinds of Dutch names on the graves. Uh, my friend, who is from the English-speaking Caribbean, didn't recognize those names at, as Dutch, uh, but I did. There were names like Gerrit van Jan de Reus, so there were enslaved people there who had been given Dutch names. Um, this was not anything, as Ken has already said in his introductory words, that we uh, would have learned in school. It was a total surprise when I uh, started to investigate this, uh, the prominent role that the Netherlands had played in the colony New Netherland, uh, also to introduce slavery in New York. Um, this came as a total surprise, and since then I've been in several different places to gouge the extent and the scope of the Dutch Empire, which is truly incredible, um, spanning, um, let's say, um, the, the, the two major parts are the eastern part of empire, are Indies, they are called, now Indonesia, which is the jewel in the crown. South Africa was part of the Netherlands. And then there is the western part of empire. That is Suriname and the Dutch Antilles. And I was born in Suriname. I left there when I was one year old. Uh, besides those three major parts, there are different forts along the coast of West Africa. Uh, parts of Japan, China, Taiwan, um, formerly Formosa, were a part of the Dutch Empire. All this is um, hidden knowledge. It is buried. We do not like to know about it. We do not find it worthwhile to transmit it to future generations. If you're interested in, in this, you're on your own to find out uh, what um, has gone on. So. Also, from this background of um, uh, erasure, total erasure, came this need to think about us as a Dutch people. I wanted to know, how is it possible to have been an imperial nation for close to 400 years and to think simultaneously that this will not have left traces in our history, in our language, in the way we build our institutions. Um, importantly, how we think about ourselves and about the other, whether the other in particular eras, as now, is Muslim, or as a couple of decades ago, the ultimate other was black. Um, how is it possible to bring those two things together and an important, Part of my book is to look into that paradox. How we manage, what kinds of technologies of the self we manipulate, we employ, we deploy to keep that basic innocence intact. The 
that innocence that we ascribe to ourselves. So innocence is clearly tongue in cheek and in uh, inverted commas. Um, so I have to say that um, one of the important decisions I had to take when I started writing this book, uh, I started writing full time in the beginning of 2013, was whether I would write it in Dutch, which would have been the uh, more self-evident thing to do, you would think, or whether I would write in English. I decided to write it in English, A, because I wanted to be part of a larger circle of people thinking about how can we study um, post-colonialism in a decolonial way. I wanted to uh, be a part of a larger circle of people talking about that. But secondly, I had seen in the Netherlands how Dutch criticism dealt with Philomena Asset, who has written about everyday racism um, against black people. Uh, from the end of the 70s on, she has coined the term everyday racism, and she was dismissed and demolished in um, public criticism, so I thought I'm not going to be uh, repeating that. I do not want to limit my criticism to Dutch critics, uh, critics. I want to be also in this respect part of a wider circle. Okay, so to end this part, I think you may think, or the Netherlands, if it is thought about at all in the US, is thought to be kind of like Denmark, this cute little nation uh, with very few people <laughs> um, that is a champion of all kinds of freedoms. Um, I really want to disabuse you of that, uh, of that notion. Um, I want to propose a different grand narrative about the Netherlands that does take race into account because as I explain, I think uh, the Netherlands, through its ambitions to be an, arc, uh, an empire, built itself on the basis of race. But race has been studiously avoided from the beginning. We have all kinds of grand narratives, the struggle against the water, how uh, polarization played an important role, uh, like these different pillars of um, uh, Protestantism, socialism, humanism, that that is the basis of Dutch society, how one learns to live together with people who are different. Um, all those different grand narratives of all those different grand narratives, and that includes U.S. writers like Simon uh, Schama, The Embarrassment of Riches, and other um, people who are very well regarded, they have taken over that Dutch blindness with regard to race. So race is never taken into account. Okay. Um, so however flawed um, the situation in the US is, to me it has been incredibly important to live here and to uh, see that there were other ways in which one could deal with race. And uh, I know it's full of contention and difficulty, but compared to the voidness that race occupies in the Netherlands, it has been very beneficial to me to take it as a starting point. Okay, so these are my... Um, introductory remarks whereby I will close off this part by saying that I'm a cultural anthropologist by training, but I work at a crossroad of the social sciences and the humanities. I 
uh, use methods from the social sciences like participant observation, interview, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but I also use uh, methods from the humanities by doing discursive and narrative analyses. I like to um, uh, use methods like um, watching television, watching the images that are presented to us on a daily basis. I analyze novels. Um, so um, I, I try to bring together these different um, disciplines. Okay, now the fourth, the third part that I'm going to talk about, that is about the paradoxes in Dutch dominant self-representation. First, I want to point to the paradox that there is an incredible passion um, and even aggression when race is put on the table in the Netherlands. Um, I don't know how many of you are aware of the phenomenon of Black Piet, uh, Swarte Piet, yes? Does everybody know Swarte Piet? No? Uh, Black Piet is a, a figure that plays a part uh, starting from November um, and his celebration with the bishop that he accompanies, a white bishop uh, accompanied by a whole bunch of black servants. Uh, the celebration takes place on December 5th. Since 40 years, black people in the Netherlands have been protesting against this phenomenon. He's a figure in blackface. It's a white person who has exaggerated uh, uh, black features with big uh, lips, uh, uh, incredibly big afro, uh, golden earrings. He wears uh, a costume of a middle-aged um, uh, page. He talks in a grammatically very deplorable ways, incorrect. He's very dumb. Um, he's a, a, a clear servant of this white bishop. So since 40 years, black people have been saying this is a racist phenomenon, we need to get rid of him. But in 2011, this was picked up by international media and then it took off like wildfire. Um, and a real rift in Dutch society showed where 90% of the Dutch people didn't see a problem with this figure. What was wrong with us, with us black people, to be so resistant to him? Um, there was such incredible force um, behind this uh, movement um, that took shape in different uh, shapes and forms, but which was very threatening to people who dared to open their mouth against this blackface figure. So a lot of passion and aggression um, came up, whereby protesters, anti-black peak protesters, were beat up by the police, thrown in jail. There have been several court cases um, uh, to uh, abolish this, uh, this uh, figure. So far, nothing has changed yet, but it's now a year-long debate, basically, in Dutch society. So that is one way where you see that passion and aggression. Another one is in the figure of Silvana Simons. I have to say I am very, very proud and happy uh, that since a, a couple of months there is a political party led by a black woman. It's called Article One. Uh, and Article 1 refers to the first article in the Dutch Constitution that everybody who finds him or herself in the Netherlands should be treated equally. Um, so this is the first party, political party in Europe and in the Netherlands led by a black woman and she has gathered a wide variety of people uh, around her and I'm one of them. Um, uh, LGBT 
LGBTQI people, uh, people of all religions, people of all skin colors are a part of this party. So we didn't win a seat in parliament, but it has become a, a, a great social movement and is going to uh, develop further in the coming four years. But the racism that has been uttered at Silvana has been staggering. So you see what happens is that when black people start to um, uh, register the racism directed against particular figures, figurations, particular events, the full force of um, racist uh, um, rejection and malaise is uttered. So you have passion, aggression that race elicits, and on the other hand, um, as opposite that, we find the dominant ways of dealing with race in the Netherlands are denial and disavowal. So the denial of race, and disavowal is the psychoanalytical term that is used when uh, in the same breath something is conceded, but it is also immediately denied again. Small example of that. There's a television program uh, by a white journalist called um, Jack Spikerman. He's receiving a black um, journalist, Umberto Tang, and um, Jack has a quiz on soccer, uh, and he's asking Umberto all kinds of questions about soccer. And then Umberto doesn't know the answers, and then Jack Spikerman says to Umberto, ah, good grief, you're black, and you're stupid on top of that. This is something that is without a problem uttered on television, on national television. Uh, then when a little storm arises after this utterance, Jack Spikerman says, you know, I'm such good friends with Umberto, I can say these things to him. Um, we know each other so well. Then the storm gets a little bigger, and then he says, um, you know what, I shouldn't have said it. Uh, that wasn't uh, too uh, uh, appropriate that I said that, but I didn't mean anything by it. So in the same breath that he uh, exceeds that this was racist, he again withdraws it by saying, but I didn't mean it that way, as if intention is the sole uh, measuring stick for whether something is racist or not. Okay, so that was the first paradox. The second one. The Netherlands is a nation of descendants of migrants. One in every six Dutch has migrant ancestry. Whether these are Huguenots, uh, people coming from Belgium, Germany, um, people from the UK, and then in the later decades, say from the late 1940s on, people from the former colonies came to the Netherlands. First from Indonesia, later from uh, Suriname and the Dutch Antilles. Um, so even though we are a nation of descendants of migrants, there is no identification with migrants in the public sphere. In the private sphere, you can talk about your grandmother who came from Italy or from Germany but it doesn't add to your public persona to talk about your migrant forefathers or foremothers. Now what we see happening here is um, that every uh, memory of migration, every outward sign of it should be erased as fast as possible. You shouldn't be wearing Muslim dress, um, you shouldn't be remembering past trauma that has been done to your people, one should assimilate as fast as possible. That is really the only option one has. 
When one doesn't assimilate, one is segregated. Now, of course, it's very easy to see that those of us who have migrant ancestry, who are white, can much more easily lay a claim to Dutchness than those of us who may have been here for four generations, but who had ancestry of color. I can never claim Dutchness. I do, but it's kind of ridiculous uh, in Dutch eyes that I claim Dutchness. So color is uh, a, a, a very stringent divider there um, about who can claim Dutchness. Now the interesting thing is another television program that is called Unknown Heritage. That is a very popular show where uh, well-known Dutch people go looking for their roots, where their ancestors came from. And invariably, people from the colony show up. <laughs> and then they are, you know, they're flabbergasted. <laughs> How did that happen? How did that get past them? But it is all over the place, huh? this mixity, the hybridity, but on a public level, it is steadfastly denied. The third paradox in Dutch self-representation is that we are, um, were the innocent victims of the Germans during the Second World War, during uh, the years 40, 45 but that we were perpetrators of excessive violence in Indonesia at almost the same time, between 45 and 49, is something that we really do not like to know about. We do not call those wars which the Indonesian waged for their independence, we do not call them wars, we call them Pollutional actions, actions by the police. So it's very euphemistic. It is only now in 2017 that the government has agreed to have research done um, about the Dutch atrocities against the Indonesians. Um, that is 70 years ago. And it's only now uh, that we are ready to research what actually happened. We have erased that from our memories. We have erased it from history books. Um, it is something that we do not want to identify with nor come to terms with. So here it is also very important to see that the differential value ascribed to the colony in the east, the jewel in the crown, the Indies, is very different from the value ascribed to the western colonies, Suriname and the Dutch Antilles. Whereas the, uh, the Indies are looked upon with great awe, uh, it was much bigger, the revenues that came from um, the Indies uh, were such that they paid for the abolition of slavery in the western part of empire. Um, the dominant attitude towards the western part of empire is let's get rid of it as fast as possible. Um, a, a lot of respectlessness towards the western part of empire. The fourth um, paradox in um, Dutch self-representation is this juxtaposition between the scope and the fastness of the Dutch imperial presence in the world and its almost total absence in the Dutch educational curriculum. You can only take electives in university when you want to learn about um, Dutch empire. So let me sum up so far. What we see is a denial of the Dutch role in empire. We see the denial of race as a current social and symbolical grammar. So 
Under the influence of gender studies, there has been some insight developed that gender is uh, an important grammar of difference in society, in ourselves, um, institutionally, that gender plays an important role. Such insights are totally lacking with regard to race. When you look, for instance, um, at um, the past year, I did work at the University of Amsterdam. I was the chair of the Diversity Commission. Um, there was an occupation in 2015 at the University of Amsterdam, like in many more places in the world where students uh, wouldn't take it anymore. They were asking like, why is my curriculum so white? Why are all my teachers white? They wanted more diversity. So I was appointed a chair of um, the diversity committee. And during our research at the university, this became very clear. When you take diversity in a very broad way, uh, encompassing gender and race and sexuality and people with different abilities, when you start talking with um, staff about diversity, they would be very well able to talk about gender, that it's important to have gender measures taken, so there are more profess uh, female professors, uh, that there are equal numbers of male and female students, and so on and so forth. And they wanted to talk about internationalization, but they didn't want to talk, nor could they talk, about race. Race is totally bracketed. From the idea that we do not need to talk about it, because we do not do race. Once these people are ready to come into the university, they will come, they are not ready yet. Okay, so, so going back to the summation, there's also a, a fast color and power evasiveness. Uh, that is a habitus, as, as Bourdieu would call it. The next um, um, heading, I'm winding up, Satya. Uh, uh, that is about, so what does this dominant Dutch self-representation look like? It is a very rosy, self-flattering picture that circulates. We are the champions of women's liberation. This is notwithstanding all kinds of indicators to the contrary. Like, for example, those female professors we are number 19 on a list of 100, then it's always said that we uh, are behind Botswana in that regard, which in itself is kind of a racist. <laughs> but <laughs> doesn't make it any better, I would say. But we are the champions of women's liberation. We are the champions, furthermore, of gay, lesbian, uh, bisexual, trans, queer, um, and intersex liberation. We are ethically on the right side of all kinds of issues, whether it's euthanasia or the liberalization of uh, soft drugs or abortion, what have you, we are on the right side of history. And this is not only the case nationally, internationally. We are also big players with our international um, NGOs, with all these different courts of justice in The Hague, we really have a role to play in international justice. Without us, things are bound to go wrong. We furthermore are uh, colorblind and free of racism. Uh, so the US and South Africa, yes, there is racism there, but we do not do race. So it is by self-flattering acclamation that we have decided that um, since we do not do race, we cannot be accused of racism. Um, so this is an interesting circling um, um, kind of definition of the problem. Um, however, so this is also a very successful export product. This, 
this notion about the Netherlands that is so free and so wonderful um, and so progressive really um, is a figment of the imagination. I just want to briefly point out two events. Um, one happened to me when I had my first a uh, real job that was as a civil servant in the 80s. I worked for the Ministry of Well-Being, Welfare and Health. I went to a meeting in the south of Holland and I needed to explain the, uh, the policy of the ministry. I got into that room, it was full of white people. Um, I walked up to the first white man I encountered, I extended my hand to him and he turned around and he took his jacket that he had hung on his chair and he gave it to me. So this was a very painful moment for us both because I saw that red flames were leaking from his face because I said, you know, I'm not uh, working in the, uh, how do you call that place where the coats are hung? The clothes room. Um, I'm uh, the representative of the ministry. Um, <laughs> um, but what it shows, of course, is the continuity in the images that are held on to, that have been held on to in the cultural archive, that which is, which is between our ears. What has been deposited over 400 years he cannot imagine that I could be his equal, much less his superior, as the case would be. Um, I am there to serve him, to be of help to him, as my ancestors were during the 400 years preceding this. Yes, I want to now, in the last part, um, turn to the situation that we are currently in since um, Trump got to be elected um, to be your president. And I think the trauma is worldwide, at least we share it. In the Netherlands, progressive people are bent out of shape. And the only good thing that I can think of is that it has given a great boost to activism again, and the political party that I mentioned, Article 1, is also a result of that, uh, those developments. And what we have seen in the Netherlands after Trump's election, which really I read as um, dominant masculine whiteness, uh, uh, being on the rise, and it is a variety that doesn't apologize for its innocence. So whereas uh, sometimes you find apologies around white innocence, this is an unapologetic masculine whiteness, and it's even aggressive in its ignorance. Um, Charles Mills, the philosopher, talks about um, white innocence as not knowing, but then there's also not wanting to know. And I really find that um, difference, that there is a gender difference in that aggressive uh, ignorance versus what I f uh, find more among women, which is a kind of avoidance and fear to deal with whiteness. So we are kind of in the same boat um, when we are looking at different places in Europe, um, the Netherlands, France, Italy, the elections in Germany are coming up. We're a rather fragile um, uh, European structure in which the right wing decidedly is on the rise and we have lived through an earlier moment, as I said before, in 2010, when Geert Wilders' party for freedom 
uh, supported the sitting government of um, conservatives and Christian Democrats. When we look back at that period that lasted almost two years, we see that PVV managed to abolish all subsidies of museum and museums and cultural centra uh, that were built around people of color. So there were museums for Moluccans, for people from Indonesia, museums for Surinamese people, all of them have been abolished. The swing to the right that we see is also very palpable in that that conservative party, VVD, under Prime Minister uh, Mark Rutte, um, has kind of moved in the direction of PVV. So it's not really a victory, even though everybody was um, uh, crazy with joy when PVV didn't uh, become the biggest party, but it, it's a uh, it's, uh, period uh, victory because it doesn't mean anything. Our prime minister wrote a letter prior to the elections on uh, March 15th to all Dutch people, in which he said, among other pe uh, things, that everybody should behave normally, whatever that is. In addition, he said, whoever dares to accuse ordinary Dutch people of racism should leave the country. Um, I don't want to scare you more than uh, you are already, but um, this doesn't bode well for our futures, and I think it is upon us to be activists in whatever small and big acts we can think of. Okay. Thank you, Carol. Um, yes, very uh, good remarks. Um, but the first one was about apartheid. I didn't uh, pay much attention in the book, I have to admit, to South Africa. Um, why? Because what I am doing already is so out of the beaten track. That is, if in the Netherlands we are talking about our former colonies, it is self-evident that we are talking about Indonesia. The western part of empire hardly comes into play. So what I've done, first I try to rewrite a narrative of the Netherlands while bringing the colonies into one analytical field with the metropole. Most of the time, these are totally different things. Eh? They're written in different uh, disciplines uh, that usually do not meet at all. Um, Laura Ann Stoller talks about it uh, in her book. In the UK and in France, we see a certain pride in those uh, former colonies. And there are attempts to write history while bringing the metropole in one analytical field with the colonies. That's not done in the Netherlands. These are two separate historical streams, historical sites that are different. Now what I do, I bring them together, and on top of that, I do not only pay attention to the East Indies, but also to the West Indies. It became too much for me to also deal with South Africa, but this is my feeling. Uh, apart from the term apartheid, which is, of course, very Dutch, and which, to my mind, very well describes current Dutch realities, it is a country of apartheid where um, um, it is very rare, especially in the circles in which I uh, move, like uh, the academy, uh, the, the government, to see people of color. They are totally white institutions. I think in all of the Netherlands, 
there are maybe five um, female professors of color. Um, men may be a little more, but it's a totally white business. So also in all kinds of social respects, people of color have mixed groups surrounding them, but white people are predominantly surrounded by other white people. So in that sense, apartheid doesn't come from the Netherlands by pure coincidence. It, it's part of our makeup. Um, for the longest time, um, the Netherlands, of course, supported the Boers, the, the Dutch descended people against the British. But then during the 70s and 80s, uh, we were very fierce in um, supporting ANC and the uh, abolishing of apartheid. Now, there's currently a very uh, big exhibition going on in the Rijksmuseum on South Africa, where this part of our history is foregrounded, how we were on the right side of things for once. Um, uh, so no even um, representation of our relationship to uh, South Africa at all. I fully agree with you that um, um, the relationship with the Western part of empire Suriname has become independent um, and has a lot of its own uh, problems, which I won't go into right now, but though I will tell you that once in a while, um, the dictator who has become the president, Bouterse, reminds me awfully of Trump. But the other um, islands, the six islands, have um, occupied different positionings with regard to the Kingdom of the Netherlands, but in many ways, it is a neo-colonial tie that is still um, operative. And so I'm not surprised at all that all the writers uh, came from the Netherlands. Um, I also uh, think um, when I was talking about this gender difference with regard to uh, white innocence, where I, in the Netherlands, discern um, uh, 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 a patriarchal uh, denial and ignorance uh, with men, and in women, more of a fear and avoidance, that it's not at all uh, impossible that women may take different positions. And um, as you point out, Kellyanne Conway uh, goes, um, uh, that route, and I wouldn't be surprised if that would be happening in the Netherlands also. What I see more, though, when I uh, am talking with uh, women about Zwarte Piet, what is often the case is that women uh, express themselves, white women, I wish you would see how much it is costing me to give up on Swarte Piet and to withhold him from my children because I have such good memories of these festivities. And I wish you would acknowledge all the pain that it is causing me. That is the kind of discourse that I um, hear a lot. So, so that is a, a really basically a lot of white fragility, I would say, that is going on. Um, the third point about uh, universities being structured around whiteness, there is, yeah, there is a, a chapter in my book, it's so totally true. I am looking at gender studies and how it is structured silently around whiteness and how we have different side, sites where women are studied white women, then you have so-called allochtonous women, women who are from elsewhere, again, euphemistic term, to 
indicate women of color from Suriname, Antilles, Turkey, Morocco, which are the largest ethnic minority groups. Then the third side where women are studied are, um, these are women from the south. And race is the divider between these different sides and it's never commented upon. And I think it is important that all of us should become very aware of the genealogies of our different disciplines and how whiteness and violence are built into them. I totally agree with that. I really hope, would hope, that the work that I have done in the Netherlands would be useful in this context too. That would be really my desire, uh, both to have an intra-European set of studies on what white innocence looks like in different European countries. I'm dying to know that. Nobody has studied it yet. It's really a new set of uh, ideas and with a new toolbox that is brought to bear on these issues. I'm dying to know what, you know, some nations that haven't actively been imperial, yet they're not lacking in ideas about themselves. Um, so even if you didn't have actual colonies, they were part of this same ethos of uh, imagining themselves as I would like to see that happen in the intra-European comparison set of studies. I've just recently seen such a study about Portugal, which is also so interesting, such a small nation with a vast empire, so really comparable to the Netherlands, where also a lot of race gets erased under the idea of these were friendly encounters between Portuguese and these natives in Angola and Mozambique and what have you. Anyway, this needs to happen, but also I would like to see the, the comparison with the US uh, with the help of these uh, concepts and that uh, Chandra has so graciously put forward. Let me say this about what can one do? Um, I have to say that in the reception of the book in the Netherlands, I'm usually quite irritated at these white journalists who give me three minutes to speak about the argument in the book, but in the same three minutes, I also have to lay out what the solutions are, um, which to me says something about, um, you know, lack of accountability, Whose problem is this? It's not theirs. They don't take any kind of accountability for it. I need to come up with what we have to do. So most of the time I'm irritated even at the question. But I do think that it is a joint responsibility we are facing here if we want to live in radically egalitarian societies. It is time to step up to the plate, not only for people of color, but expressly for white people. And I cannot, um, um, uh, you know, list this list of 10 things that you have to do. You need to take your own responsibility and um, talk with each other about what it is you can possibly contribute to this may be helped by the toolbox that I laid down. I can also say that what I think is really, really important, and I don't know whether that is applicable here, what I often notice, one of the ways to bring racist content across in a Dutch context is humor and irony as if it is a joke. So the most racist, sexist, homophobic remarks can pass, and the person at who it is directed is often dumbstruck, doesn't know how to answer. People who are standing around need to interrupt this violence. There is 
uh, responsibility for all of us to interrupt that, to not let it pass, to point out that you do not like this joke, it's racist, it's sexist, what have you. That is not that, I mean, it's not easy to do, but you don't have to be Einstein to start doing it, to make it a, a fixed practice to interrupt that. <laughs>